<clears throat> there we go, we're here. <sighs> Happy Sabbath to each one of you. Today was my first week on the job. I've started a new role. Absolutely love it. Chaplain at the Christian School Wax, Adventist Christian Academy, Wax. First day on the job, I was late. My new boss was very uh, accommodating and kind. And uh, yeah, I'm really actually looking forward to um, this year and the, the opportunities of working with the school. And we're just grateful that we can support our, our young teaching family here uh, at church, that we can uh, give them support in their ministry to our school kids there. Last, yesterday, my wife read me a news title. I'm going to read it to you. Man suing his parents for giving birth to him without consent. I said to her, this is a joke, right? No, no. She gave me the news uh, site and where she found it. It's real. Name's Rafael Samuel. He lives in Mumbai. He's 27 years old. He's suing his parents for without gaining consent to give birth to him. He's a part of an anti-natalist or natalist, anyways, a movement that believes it's morally wrong to give birth to human life. And uh, I reckon, well, okay, they can uh, choose that path if they wish, but I reckon their passion will die with them, won't it? Anyways, the kind of the theme of what he's driving for is that he's the result of a choice that he wasn't involved in making, and so he's not responsible for that choice. His parents are, so they should be paying him to live the rest of his life. His parents are both lawyers, so I'm, they probably can. And, <laughs> and his mother said to him that if <clears throat> she had known him n now, before he was born, she would have chosen not to give birth to him. Now, I don't know if she's come to some new enlightened truth in this anti-natalist movement, but I think that's interesting that in society today, that when things aren't coping and things aren't working, we like to blame someone, don't we? And uh, that's really our coping mechanism, whether it's finding fault in some legal matter or there's uh, an accident, who's to blame? Somebody's got to be pinned. Who's at fault? And accidents can't just be accidents anymore. And yet, the Christian is accused of being a weak individual that relies upon God like a crutch. And they have to get through life depending upon their God. Well, friends, I'd rather depend on my God as my crutch than making my way through life, making everything bad happen someone else's fault. And that I can face trial and I can face circumstances and I can face them confidently with my God. So it's an interesting. You can look it up if you like. It's an interesting little, little article. Let's just bow our heads once more, one more and we'll seek the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come with open hearts, open minds, and we're seeking a blessing from you. I pray, Father, that you would train my mouth to speak your words of life, that it would bring hope, that it would bring encouragement to someone, cause them to think of you and their relationship with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I read a really good... I learned a new word this year. It's called a meme. You guys ever heard of the word meme? I'm still not sure what it is, but I'm thinking a meme, some sort of little saying you can read on the internet. Anyways, I think it was a meme, but I read it. It was on a social media, and it was, I think it was very fitting for 
pastors. And it said this, when in the home of a pastor, it is your right to remain silent because whatever you do or say may be used as a sermon illustration. <laughs> and so I want to share with you some of the, the quiet longings and problems that I have in my own heart uh, and in our family. See, when I first moved to New Zealand, I, I had this, this quiet and hidden desire. I like to fish. And that was something I knew how to do back in Canada in the creeks and the streams. And that was something I enjoyed in my pastime. But here, you know, you cast your bait out off the shore and then the wave just <laughs> spits it back onto the shore. And I said, this isn't working. And I give you my honest uh, uh, word this morning is I did my level best to try and catch a fish. Not all of us are Stephen that can just go to his special spot and catch a fish from the shore. And I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and got nothing. I'm sure I added to the ecosystem of the waters with distributing bait quite thoroughly up and down the shorelines. But I said to my wife, man, if we could just get off the shore to where the fish are, and we could catch a fish, and it's not so much about catching and eating, but it's just I want to catch it, and I want to look at it, and sniff it, and smell it, and put it back in the water, and, and enjoy that. And then some dear friends of mine took me out on their boat, and I got to taste the good life of catching a fish, you understand? And then another friend, now... Don't get me wrong, I'm not fishing for someone to have sympathy on me to take me out in their boat right now, okay? But I got a taste of the good life, and I said to my wife, I said, I'm tired of shore fishing. I said, if we can just get a little boat, just a little tinny, and if we can just get off the shore so that we can catch a fish, I'll be happy. She said, you'll be happy? I said, I'll be happy. And so this actually got her involved now, and she starts looking and scouring the deals. And for the price of baby buying a, a kayak, we were able to piece together this little tinny with a, a tiny little trailer. Now, my trailer's too small, my boat is too big, and my motor's too small, but we have fun, all right? And we managed to get this deal for the price of possibly buying a kayak. I had to do some wrenching. I had to do some sanding. I had to uh, take apart this motor to get it pumping water. And I've, it's been a blessing to learn these things, right? And uh, we've caught fish. Thank you. Yes, we've caught some fish. And it's been a, been a joy this summer. And we were putting along at full noise with our little eight-horse motor, you know, just cruising along in the harbor, and then my brother-in-law comes with his jet ski and phew, like passes us like we're standing still. I'm thinking, man, wouldn't it be nice, <laughs> nice to go faster? My wife starts singing this song of, you said you'd be happy. I said, yeah, you're right. And then, <clears throat> you know, we've had some joys of learning. Uh, we're becoming men of the sea, of learning and understanding, reading the swell and the chop and knowing that, hey, if it's just windy, let's just stay home. And we're learning and enjoying a lot of things. And then I start thinking to myself, now, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a boat that we could sleep on? My wife says to me, you said you'd be happy. You know, I think that's a part of our human nature. We become, i got to spit this word out, destinationalist. That we put our hopes and our dreams in the future that if, if that could just happen, then I would be happy, right? If I, once I reach that destination, my, my dreams would be fulfilled. And thank you, Tony, put up the, the title for today's message, Life is Like a Box of Chocolates. 25 years ago, a film came out that coined this phrase. Life is like a box of chocolates. What's the rest of it? You never know what you're going to get, right? You never know what you're going to get. And I think that's quite a neat analogy, that life is a little bit like a box of chocolates. And I don't know if you've ever 
<clears throat> had the pleasure of eating a box of chocolates that you, you get into it and you totally ignore the little road map that comes with the box of chocolates and you go for that, that lovely square one that's got squiggly drizzle lines all over and you're thinking, man, this is going to be good. And you bite into it and maraschino cherries drool out, right? And you, you look and make sure no one sees and you put it back and then you... You take a bite of another one, and some dried-out orange peeling comes out of the middle. And you're thinking, man, and it just keeps getting worse. And finally, you, you find one that tastes good, and you you're just had it. You've had too much sweet stuff already, and you're just like, it's not even good anymore. And you're thinking, if I could just have that chocolate, if I could just have that one. And once you do, you're Disappointed. Disappointed. It's easy to fix our hopes and our dreams on always living in the future of what is going to be, and we completely ignore the present and the blessing of right now and the blessing of the journey right now that God is leading us through. Now, would it be wrong to strive to improve one's life? Let's say maybe you're you're struggling to make, one, make ends meet or you could improve some health. No, it's not wrong. That's the short answer. It's not wrong to improve one's health or to improve one's situation. But we're going to come back to that in a moment. But I want to dig a little bit into Paul and his perspective on how he dealt with life and how he was solid. And come whatever happened, he was strong. And I want to go to Philippians chapter 4. So... Dig out your Bibles, whether it's on a phone, whether you got the, the kind that you can, can smell and turn pages. I like my Bible. It's Matthew cha or Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to go there to verse 11. Philippians 4, and we're going to start in verse 11. All right, the Bible tells us. I'm reading from the New King James. Philippians 4, verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need. So Paul's just wanting to clarify here. He's not fishing for sympathy. He's not fishing for a boat ride. He's not fishing for empathy. He's just saying, I'm not speaking in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am, to be content. Now this is something he says that he had to learn. He had to learn that all things work together for good to them that love God and to those that are called according to his purpose. He had to learn that. He had to learn that when he's on in prison. By the way, he is in prison while writing this. He had to learn that when ships were sinking and he's having to swim for his life. He had to learn to be content in that moment. He had to learn in the face of adversity of, of Christian brethren wondering, is this guy for real? Is he just trying to get in among us so he can kill us? He had to prove his, his faithfulness to God and to the ministry. He had to learn to be content when people hated him and they wished that he had never lived. It says in verse 12, he says, I know how to be abased. That is to be humbled, to be put down. And I know how to abound. He says, I know how to be when it's good and I know how to be when it's bad. I've learned to be content. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. New Living Translation says, I've learned the secret of living in every situation. So we got to ask Paul, what's your secret? You can be hungry, you can be starving, you can be happy, you can be, have everything going well, you can be completely humbled and just have the shirt on your back. He says, I have a secret and I've learned to be content in whatever situation it is. And he comes through with this resounding truth in verse 13. He says, this is my secret. I can do all things through Christ." who strengthens me. Amen? Amen? 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is what he learned. In the face of hardship, in the face of good times, both times he recognized that I can do this through Christ, depending on his strength and not his own. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, this is Paul speaking of how he has dealt through uh, deals with different situations. In 1 Corinthians 10, wonderful, beautiful promise that when facing temptation, when facing struggle, this is one that we can claim and that we can take to the bank and cash it in because God's word is true and his word is faithful and we can trust it and believe it. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, says, no temptation has overtaken you such as is common to man. Don't think your situation is unique or special, okay? It's common. Even though you may feel like you're the only one screaming your head off, wondering when God is going to come through and see your plight and see your situation. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but when the temptation, but with the temptation, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Paul says, you know what? When I'm facing temptation, you know, maybe your temptation's chocolate cake or whatever it is. Let's just think of chocolate cake for a moment. You know, and you just see it and you just, you can't help yourself and you got to eat it, right? You don't just eat one piece, but two, but maybe three. Chocolate cake's not my thing. Gooey chocolate cake, maybe. God has provided a way of escape when you, before you've even reached that temptation. And often we just throw up our hands and say, you know, I just give in. I just got to eat the cake, you know? And we just jump right in, but we're not willing to take God at his word and say, you know what? Lord, I trust that you've provided a way of escape and maybe it's the door and I have to just get outside and stop smelling the cake. And we need to look for ways and means that may be not within our first choice and first option and wait for God to come through because he does. He provides a way of escape or he will help you to bear it. And I think that's a wonderful promise. And this is the secret that Paul had begun to learn and began to apply and was able to apply in his life that it is Christ that gives me strength. I can do all things. So what does it say, say in Galatians chapter 2? This was the perspective to, to Paul and how he approached life. Galatians 2 in verse 20, I'm taking you to the old and the, and the good, the oldies but the goodies, these passages here. Galatians 2 and verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me, and he gave himself for me. This is the secret of Paul's life. That when Paul is walking down his road of life and when he meets trial, when he meets circumstances that is, is too much to bear, he says, oh yeah, it's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. And it's not me that's facing this trial, but it's Christ. And he's already provided a way of escape or he's provided the grace, the strength to bear it. And I know it's a cliche saying, but one that we use, that Christ, he is enough for me. And he was enough for, Christ, for Paul. And he believed that that's all I need. I don't need fame. I don't need fortune. I don't need a, a cushy bed. I need Christ. Because then I can bear it. He can see me through. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, let's go over there, 2 Corinthians 12, and interesting passage here, about the, he talks about the thorn that he had in his flesh, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7, he says, unless I should be exalted above 
measure by the abundance of the revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. He says, I got this thorn in my flesh, and it's almost like it's there to keep me humble. And you know what? I, I think uh, my speech, it helps keep me humble. Sometimes my wife just shakes her head in the back there. She's like, did he really just say that? You know, I stumble, I stammer over words, and I come away and I think, wow, Lord, only you are going to be able to speak to these people because I feel like I just made a fool of myself. But Paul here, he has a thorn in his flesh. Now, some people, they've, they've, they've tried to reason that maybe that was a, a, some sort of physical ailment. Maybe it was a type of fever, that he, a reoccurring of fever. Some thought maybe it was even conjunctivitis. But to uh, compare Scripture with Scripture, let's use a little bit of reasoning here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4, and we see, uh, sheds a little bit of light of what his, uh, we're going to go back to 2 Corinthians, so keep a finger there, but Galatians chapter 4 and verse 13, he says, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first, and my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received uh, me as an angel of God, even as of Christ Jesus. That when the blessings, what then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So he's speaking to the people in Galatia. He says, you guys are wonderful. You're great. You received my message with, 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 with such joy and that you loved me with such Christ-like love that you were willing, you, you didn't hold my infirmity against me, but you, you were willing to pluck out your own eyes and give them to me. And so we can use reason and uh, a little help with the spirit of prophecy that Paul had a, a, a seeing impen, uh, impairment. He had a struggle with his vision. He says, but it kept him humble. And in 2 Corinthians 12, let's go back there. 2 Corinthians 12 and carrying on in verse 8. It says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness, therefore, most gladly, Paul says, most gladly I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and in reproach and in needs and in persecution and in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's secret It's Christ that gives me strength. That I can ex be exalted or I can be humbled. That whatever exterior circumstance that I face, I can face it with Christ. And I can be content. How many of us can say that? You know, I pray that that can be my experience. I pray that that can be your experience because we know some dark valley will cross our path. We know some joyous and happy experience will come your way. And often in those, those highs and those lows, often people find faith or they lose it. But in each and every day, maybe just the mediocre life that you just keep on living day in and day out through Christ. You wonder, how long can you do this through Christ how much more can I take through Christ? He can give you strength. Went for a swim on Waitangi Day in the Kaiwi Lakes. And just to give you an idea, I didn't grow up swimming. I'm probably one of those people you'd be embarrassed to swim with. Because I look more like a blender, you know, in the water that got turned loose. And... Uh, you know, you see little kids out there snorkeling, and then you see me. I know the Kaiwi Lakes is really nothing to see, but I'm out there with my goggles, you know? I'm mean, just enjoying, enjoying the cool, the refreshing water. And I'm swimming, and then there's a little bit of chop coming out, and I'm just like powering out there, whoosh, whoosh, swimming. And this is a big deal, because I have a fear 
a little bit of fear of water. Leanne can vouch for me. She keeps hinting at this and poking and prodding. It's, it's sharks. It's really it's sharks that I'm scared of. And I know they're not in the Kaiwi Lakes, but you still, I don't know. Anyways, I'm out there swimming. And I got my snorkel and I'm just, just giving her. And it was good because I was going with the wind. And then I turn her in, and then all of a sudden it starts splashing over my snorkel. And when you're, you know, it's not good to inhale water. It doesn't work so good. And I'm like trying to breathe and I can't stick my face. Now I got this thing on my face. I can't get it off. And I'm, all of a sudden I feel like I need air. Right? <laughs> I don't know why I told you that. What were we talking about? <laughs> Our need for Christ. It's like air, isn't it? That it takes a moment of, ha ha, I need this. I need air. And it may be some exalted moment in your life. It may be some debasing moment in your life. But it may take that moment to help us click in and to tune in to recognize that I need air. I need Christ. Paul, he had his thorn in the flesh, and it kept him humble. And he's willing to cling to Christ and willing to even bear it and to even be somewhat proud of it because he says, you know what, through this, it's going to cause me to lean even more heavily on Christ. With all the complaining that I do, with all the whinging and the whining that I do, am I learning Paul's secret? You know, I've become so destinationalized where I think if I could just be that or do that or have that, then I'll be happy. But when I'm not getting maybe the recognition that I think I deserve, you know what? We can tune into Paul's secret and we can say, you know what? I can have peace and I can be content. And so what if I just have to put my plow in for the rest of my life, and I, I, I follow in. Now, you're making me sound like I have some complex here. I don't, okay? But the point is, is that we can, we can go in, and we can be in day in and day out, and we can go through the struggles of life if we're willing to connect and to lean on Christ for strength, and he will. He will renew our strength day by day. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. You should be in Corinthians. Hang a right. Go to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. First Timothy 6 and verse 6, Paul says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. Is great gain. Now, it's interesting. Those two go hand in hand, don't they? Godliness, being godlikeness, walking with God, and being content. It is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with all these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men into destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Destinationalizing, if I could just have that. I'll be happy. And some people have chased the almighty dollar all their life just to have it in the end of their life ripped away from them and they're still not happy. Or to have their billions and they're still not happy because they need to have more or they got to worry about keeping it or whatever it is. Destinationalized. But God is calling us, whether rich, whether poor, whether surrounded by friends or having no friends, He's calling us to be content. 
How do you do that? How can we be content in all these situations? It's not something that we can muster from within ourselves. It requires surrender. It requires heart searching. And sometimes repeatedly, as Paul had to take his situation repeatedly to the Lord, and God had to say to him and assure to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. That is, coveting, desiring, wanting that, wanting what other people have. Let your conduct, let your life be without covetousness, but be content. There's that word again. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What's the secret here? It's Christ. Is being content that whether I receive the raise, whether I receive that that friendship that I'm desiring, or maybe even that marriage, or maybe even that that entertainment device, or whatever it is, whatever you are looking and hoping that that thing will bring us peace, bring me satisfaction, resting in Christ. So we gave Paul his peace and his contentment. Now, does this mean we can't seek to improve our life, and we just got to just put up with rubbish day in and day out? Does that mean we shouldn't uh, maybe try and get a better job? Does that mean we shouldn't try and improve our health? No. You know, I want to share a passage with you from Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16 and verse 9, and this has had a great impact on my life. Proverbs 16, verse 9. The Bible tells us, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. The New Living Translation says, We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. I think the Bible wants, the God, His counsel, He wants us to dream. He wants us to strive, wants us to to improve and to do better. But that we shouldn't make that end goal or the route in which we reach that goal our joy and peace. That we we hold on to our dreams with, with fingertip grip because our lives are surrendered to Christ that if... If things don't happen as I anticipated it in my mind, it's okay. I can do this through Christ. You know what? As a young person, I don't know if you ever had a crush on another girl. If you were a boy, you had a crush on a girl or vice versa, a girl and a boy. As a young person, you know, I, I, I'd come to this point that I was before I even left high school. I like, God, I need to surrender this aspect of my life to you. That if... Uh, if I'm going to, to marry the one, the right one, I want, it to be, I want it to be the one that you've led me to. And there was this girl, I was like, man, she's pretty cool. And I thought, you know what, I don't want to go there. And I surrendered that, that desire right there. And I said, you know what, I can wait. And I had this, this overwhelming thought that, you know what, as, as cool as this young lady, as, as she appeared and, 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 and was, Maybe God had a better one for me. (laughs) And he did. Hallelujah. She's sitting right back there. Is that sometimes things don't boil down the way we've anticipated or a way that we have planned. That's why we must hold our plans with just, just such a light grip, trusting and waiting for God to direct our steps. And he may take us down a journey that may strengthen us through that experience Or he may say, you know what, this is what you want, but this is actually what you need, and it's better than what you want. His plans aren't our our plans. His ways aren't our ways. And he wants us to to grow and to live a higher and, and holier life. Someone wrote to me a card recently for my birthday, a dear friend. And they wrote in the card, they said, 
Do your best. Pray for God to bless and be at rest. Let me say that again. Do your best. Pray for God to bless and be at rest. And I think that sums up the entire sermon today. Go with me back to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, and and this is the the, the clincher verse for this. Philippians 4 and verse 6. Philippians 4, verse 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Do your best, pray for God to bless, and be at rest. Here it comes, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Paul, what's your secret? I just trust Jesus. He says, when outside circumstances hit me, I just trust Jesus. That I'm working hand in hand with the one that doesn't know what failure is. And, and if I, it appears as though it's failure, all things will work together for good. And he's got it sorted. You know what? When disappointment hits, I'm just going to set that on God's desk and I'll let him deal with it. You know, it gets kind of painful when we try to put on God's shoes. Have you ever walked in someone else's shoes? You kind of get sores and aches on your feet. Last year when we were in Fiji, my dad, he had a a, a pair of, we call them tennis shoes. You guys call them tennis shoes? Little shoes, you know, for running around. He had these shoes, and, and when you go into a building, you take your shoes off there, and you go in, and you sit down on the floor, and you visit, and so on. Anyways, we had gone into the building, and there's like a whole wad of shoes out front, right? And it's great, because then you just kind of pick which one you like best and make sure you take off quickly. And that's exactly what the pastor did. Not me, there's a pastor there. His name was Tiatu, awesome guy. He had to go, he lived a little few miles away, he had to take off, and he left. And my dad goes to leave, he says, where's my shoes? Shoes were gone. And we all thought, maybe the pastor stole them. The next morning... Pastor comes back holding these shoes. He says, Somebody took my canvases. Whose are these? <laughs> they call shoes canvases. And it was such a, a funny a little experience. He says, I tried to put my foot into I couldn't get my foot into them. And then I realized, aha, I took somebody else's shoes. You know, when we are anxious and when we begin to worry and to question and to doubt, that's because we're trying to wear God's shoes, isn't it? It's a responsibility he hasn't put on our hearts. He says, let me wear my shoes, and you wear yours. And this is a personal experience. Just uh, recently, a few weeks ago, I was, I'd come to a situation where I, I didn't know what to do, and I was feeling some outside pressures. And this is exactly what I did. And I'm telling you firsthand accounts is that I brought it before God and I said, God, this is bigger than me. He says, I need your help. You know what? I had this overwhelming peace. Now, I still had to go through that situation and that circumstance and it was tough and I sweated and I, I cried and it was hard. But God gave me the strength and he saw me through it. So I want to encourage you this morning. Maybe the burden on your heart this morning is, is I need more faith to trust God. Maybe the burden on your heart is is that I need more patience to trust God. So whatever season of life you are facing today, I invite you, I encourage you, I challenge you, don't worry. Put that on God's table and let him do the worrying. You just surrender your will to his. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the promises that are in your word that we have such exceedingly great and precious promises that by claiming these, that we can become partakers of your divine nature. We ask, Lord, that we would take your word at face value, that we would trust you. When we can't see the end from the beginning, that we would say, God, this is bigger than me, and I'm grateful that you've already got it sorted. Give us that kind of faith, Lord. 
Give us that faith to trust when facing temptation, when facing loneliness, when facing anger. Lord, may we come, come to you first and seek you. Lord, thank you for the secret that was in Paul's life, that he was able to do all things through Christ. May that be our experience. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, we're going to sing, Will Your Anchor Hold? Number 534, Will Your Anchor Hold?